What if Star Wars Episode 7 was good? Over one year ago, I released a video attempting to answer that question. Obviously, having rewritten Episode 7, I had to rewrite Episode 8. Both of these rewrites were well received, so let's see if I can do what Disney and its billions of dollars couldn't do – bring the trilogy to a satisfying conclusion. Quick recap. My main focus in Episode 7 was changing the First Order to an aspiring and not entirely credible opposition to the Republic and the film actually ends with a First Order victory that comes as a shock to the Republic. In my version, the First Order isn't just a clone of the Empire in Episode 4. My big change of Episode 8 was showing how things continue to develop poorly for the Republic as the First Order manages to take it down from the inside. The big changes that carry immediately into this rewrite are the First Order control an ever-increasing number of systems and are poised to destroy the Republic, Rey has been captured by Kylo, and Finn and Poe have fallen out and gone their separate ways. I would recommend that you go back and watch the first two rewrites before starting this, as the three rewrites are intended to be viewed as one cohesive story. But just to set the scene for this rewrite, I'd like to present the following opening crawl. The galaxy is at war. The First Order continue to wrest star systems from the failing Republic, meanwhile the Republic has begun to concentrate their forces for a key assault against the First Order. In the midst of this conflict, a new threat has emerged. The upper ranks of the First Order have been infiltrated by servants of the fledgling spirit of Emperor Palpatine, who has designs to restore his former hold on power. Hoping for an army large enough to counter this threat, representatives of the Republic work tirelessly to recruit allies as they prepare to make their last stand. Ah, yes. Also, in my version, Palpatine is back. I explain why in detail in my episode 8 rewrite, because that's where I reintroduced Palpatine as a villain. Imagine if I had just introduced Palpatine out of nowhere at the beginning of this film. That would make it seem like I had no idea what I was doing and was making things up as I went along. Very embarrassing. In reality, I think bringing Palpatine back is the only way to conclude the Skywalker saga, because Palpatine is the big villain of that saga. In my version, he's used his considerable force power to preserve his life force after his physical body was destroyed by Anakin in Episode 6. I compared this to Voldemort in Harry Potter or Sauron in The Lord of the Rings, lacking a physical body due to a prior defeat, but still alive as some kind of threat, seeking a return to full power. He's a malevolent, ethereal force influencing things behind the scenes. A phantom menace, if you will. Anyway, I hope that's enough explanation to make clear that this isn't equivalent to somehow Palpatine returned. There's a reason and a narrative logic for why he's here as a threat, and I hope you'll enjoy this rewrite in a way you wouldn't if the final threat was somebody unrelated to the first two thirds of the saga. So our finale begins on the industrial planet of Kajimi. We follow some crates through a busy warehouse where a massive armament effort is occurring, until the crates are eventually placed down in front of General Poe Dameron. He is trying to convince the dealers to lower their prices, as he insists that the fight against the First Order is not a time to be profiteering. Unfortunately, Poe quickly discovers that profiteering is exactly what these people have been doing, as they reveal that they've betrayed Poe to the First Order. First Order troops storm the building and Poe and his men are captured. Meanwhile, Rey is stuck in a prison cell since having been captured in the previous film. Her prison routine consists of casually mind-tricking her fellow inmates to amuse herself or meet certain desires. She tells one of them, You don't want the top bunk. You want to give me your extra blankets. Two guards watch this unfold on security tapes as the prisoners dutifully comply with everything she says, and one remarks to the other, Um, don't leave any guards alone with her. This scene achieves three key things. Firstly, it should hopefully be slightly comedic to see Rey use her mind abilities this way, a bit like the you don't want to sell me death sticks line in Attack of the Clones. Secondly, it should show how Rey has actually been training in this way since the last film, despite being in prison, and after three films, she's now very capable as a Jedi. Thirdly, it should show how jaded she has become. In the last film, she found out that the one hope she'd had, that her parents were good people who loved her, was in fact illusory. She is working on her Jedi powers, but she clearly has very little interest in actually using her Jedi powers for some kind of noble or aspirational cause. Much like the Rancor scene in Return of the Jedi, the Republic forces led by Poe Dameron are set to be executed by a giant creature. 
I haven't had any big monsters in my series so far, so I felt like I might as well drop one here. And since designing a Star Wars monster seems like fun, this creature would have gigantic scorpion claws for arms, one eye in the middle of its head, and giant fangs drooling with slime. It can be called a Grenarag, or literally anything else. The name would just be gibberish. The fight against the creature begins with a few of Poe's men being killed, but as the word goes out around the vicinity of the warehouse that there's an execution going on, one hooded figure appears to rush to the warehouse. Poe struggles to fight back against the creature and is almost about to be eaten by it, when suddenly the creature is shot from the crowd. Poe looks into the crowd and sees Finn's face, reacting as if he's seen a ghost. But in the commotion there is no time for a reintroduction. Poe uses the creature's broken fangs to break his way through the locked door on the lower level of the warehouse, while Finn rushes off back to where his ship is parked. Poe fights his way through the warehouse until he finds himself on the roof. Finn pulls the ship up next to him, and Poe and the surviving few of his men climb aboard. For the first time since The Last Jedi, Finn and Poe see each other. Leia Organa waits for Poe on a jungle planet as she stares out at the landscape of multicolored plants. In my version of the film, I'm assuming the same constraints the actual episode 9 had, which is to say that Carrie Fisher would be dead. Although honestly, if I were in charge of Star Wars, I'd have probably shot the whole trilogy back to back, just in the interest of saving time and money. So if I'd actually been in charge, I wouldn't have that restraint. But just to make it more interesting, I'll give myself the same restriction. So most shots of Leia would be using leftover footage from the other films, with her turned away from camera most of the time, and using a sound alike for any dialogue she'd need to deliver. The main purpose of this scene would be to show how the troops on this planet are preparing before heading off to consolidate their forces for a final strike against the First Order. At this point, I want to address how my job in writing this third installment was sort of tough, but also sort of easy. See, the ways in which it was tough are pretty obvious. Concluding a story is difficult. When you're writing the first two parts of a trilogy, you can sort of introduce anything you like, and you can have the story go anywhere. But when you're writing the third part, all the story threads have to all be going in the same direction, towards a satisfying ending. And for that ending to be satisfying, all the different threads should hopefully converge to reach their conclusion in one climax that wraps up everything. That requirement is what makes concluding a story difficult, and it's why often the conclusions to trilogies are kind of disappointing. Although it isn't an excuse, because I think only a bit of effort is required to make a conclusion that does work. But it is only a bit of effort, because like I say, my job here was also sort of easy. For this film, I didn't really need to come up with that much of a plot. After all, what's the greatest trilogy of all time? The Lord of the Rings. And what's significant about The Return of the King? Well, it contains a gigantic climactic battle. So if you want the conclusion of your nine-part saga to be epic, then you might as well take notes from the most epic finale ever. This climactic battle is what we get a taste of now as it begins to build up. One of the commanders overseeing the preparations asks Leia if she thinks they have any hope of victory. Rey works her way through the canteen of the prison. We see that the prison is made up of what appear to be freight containers, and we can infer that the prison was hastily put together to accommodate the massive crackdown on freedom brought about by the First Order. The prisons obviously contain some rebels, but there are legitimate criminals thrown into the mix, and Ray's prison has a larger proportion of such individuals. Ray collects a small amount of food and heads to her seat. However, while she's walking, another prisoner makes a disparaging comment about the Jedi. Ray coldly says that she's not a Jedi. The inmate keeps antagonizing her until a brawl erupts. In this fight, we are able to see another aspect of how Ray has developed her training, the physical. Ray is now clearly a more skilled fighter, and she even utilizes some objects lying about the canteen as a makeshift staff during the brawl to show that she would be capable with a lightsaber. But this is also another reminder that she is without direction, and has no intention of being any sort of hero. Meanwhile, Finn and Poe are getting reacquainted on the ship as they head to meet up with Leia. Poe begins to apologize to Finn about everything, and admits that he made some mistakes in the past. However, he cuts himself off as he explores the ship, and stumbles upon a storage room filled with illegal merchandise. 
He correctly infers that Finn has moved on to piracy and immediately begins chastising him. Finn explains that they only target First Order shipments, but Poe shoots back that defeating the First Order with criminal activity is wrong in principle and sends a bad message by giving legitimacy to the claim that those who oppose the First Order are criminals. Finn says that the main reason people aren't joining the Republic isn't because of rebels being criminals, but because the Republic hasn't inspired confidence. With this, Poe loudly asks Finn, so why doesn't he work to change that? Poe points out that Finn is a former stormtrooper who left the First Order. He could inspire people and he could lead, and he isn't helping himself by just being another outlaw who doesn't stand for anything. Poe explains the responsibility that everybody has in this moment to stand up for what is right. Finn storms off, while Poe is left looking awkwardly at all of Finn's fellow pirates and says, no offense. Dark smoke surrounds the black temple-like structure where Palpatine's spirit resides. He is surrounded by shadowy dark attendants as we see him talking to Lor Santeca, who in my version doesn't die in The Force Awakens, but lives to betray the Republic at the end of The Last Jedi. In this rewrite I'm using the image of General Pride to represent him, because he will mostly fill the role that Pride filled in J.J. Abrams' version. Anyway, in this film he is a loyal servant of Palpatine, who is assisting in turning the military might of the First Order to Palpatine's will. Palpatine in turn informs Santeca of the location of Leia's forces, and says that the First Order should destroy them before they are in a position to link up with the larger Republic army. Palpatine points out that an army led by Kylo Ren is in the area and should be sent to destroy the base. Santeca asks if Palpatine believes Kylo has the strength to kill his own mother, to which Palpatine responds by saying that this will be Kylo's final chance to prove his loyalty to the dark side. Poe and Finn arrive at Leia's base, and they still seem to be arguing a bit, but Finn immediately goes silent as soon as he sees Rose. She runs up to him and slaps him before hugging him, expressing her anger with him for leaving the cause, but happiness that he has returned. While Finn and Rose catch up, Poe begins talking with Leia about their inability to secure the weapons. Leia is disappointed, but recognizes that it isn't the end of the world. Unfortunately, at this moment, somebody informs Leia and Poe that a First Order fleet is heading towards the base, with the ability to overwhelm them and destroy their force. Kylo lands in a walker for a ground assault, with Hux by his side commanding the army. Their large force begins to push through the jungle, using powerful cannons to create a clearing in front of them. Poe looks out at the approaching force with despair, lamenting that they'll be destroyed before they even have the strength to make a final stand. Just when there appears to be no hope, we hear the familiar voice of Luke Skywalker, as his force ghost draws near to Leia and comforts her. They have a heart-to-heart -heart as Luke assures her that everything will be fine, and that good will ultimately prevail. With this, Luke walks out to confront Kylo. As he walks, we begin to see the various leaves and flowers of the plants in the rainforest rustle and shake. Slowly, bright clouds of pigment begin to leave the flowers as Luke draws the coloured pollen and sap of the vibrant forest towards him. These vibrant colours fill out his form and give him the appearance of a living person. Luke emerges from the smoke and stands in front of Kylo's army, blocking their way. Kylo reacts to this with shock and anger as Luke stares him down. Hux assures him that they know for a fact that Luke Skywalker is dead. This is just a desperate attempt at trickery. But Kylo is transfixed by what he sees. Kylo commands the walkers to concentrate their fire on Luke, but their fire appears to have no effect. Incensed with rage at the apparent impotence of this attack, Kylo tells his men that he will be going down to confront Luke directly. Hux challenges this, but Kylo aggressively uses the force against him. You've probably noticed that this is playing out pretty much the same as Kylo's actions during the assault on Crate in Episode 8. Now, I didn't have this scene in my Episode 8 rewrite, but it is something I wanted to include, because many people have pointed out how Luke's actions here feel very appropriately Jedi. He doesn't kill anybody, he doesn't use violence, he doesn't even hold a lightsaber. Instead, he uses the Force and turns Kylo's own anger against him. It's a very clever way of winning a victory for the Republic. But of course, in my version of Episode 8, Luke dies in a different context. So how can he take a stand here after death? Honestly, I don't remember whether or not Force ghosts are supposed to be able to use the Force, but I imagine it'd make sense that they have some Force abilities. So I decided to have this final confrontation occur on a very colourful and vibrant planet, filled with plant life, so that Luke could influence the various pigments found in the environment in order to blend them within his otherwise blue form to give himself the appearance of being alive. 
Thus, Luke is able to accomplish the same thing as in Disney's version of The Last Jedi, but without needing to be alive and force projecting himself. One change I'd make from the way this plays out in The Last Jedi would be Luke not taunting Kylo, but rather letting the impotence of Kylo's anger speak for itself. Luke could even reference how Kylo is lying to himself with his over-the-top anger. Kylo would be left shaken and humiliated as he fails to use his strength to silence Luke. With this, Luke's force ghost disappears and the colourful cloud of pigment disperses, no longer being held together by the force, and Kylo is left to confront the reality that he's been played. In the meantime, of course, the Republic forces were able to escape while Kylo was distracted and can now flee the planet without suffering any losses. With the group now heading towards the rendezvous point, Poe begins taking an active role in leading and strategizing, showing that he has become a general who is highly capable of handling the responsibilities of leadership. Finn makes a move to leave, and Poe starts to express how he can't believe that Finn is leaving the fight after they've just seen how serious the threat is. However, Finn cuts him off and says, I know it's serious, that's why I'm going to get reinforcements. It's clear that he has taken to heart Poe's point about how he could be inspiring people to stand up to the First Order. Poe smiles, having realized that Finn has a renewed sense of commitment to the fight, and he tells Finn to take care until they see each other again. Kylo returns to Coruscant, still angered by his defeat. He goes to visit Rey, and it's quickly established that he visits her on a regular basis. The two talk, and Rey shows nothing but contempt for Kylo. However, Kylo seems broken and can barely even bring himself to push back against Rey. Rey appears slightly disarmed by Kylo's new demeanor. As the two share a moment of unspoken vulnerability, we get a sense that both Rey and Kylo could be willing to change from the path they're on and actually take a stand against evil. Watching over this interaction through a security camera feed, we see Law Santeca communicating with Palpatine that Kylo has failed him and shown that he is more of a liability than an asset. Santeca assures Palpatine that Kylo has few friends and it should be relatively uncomplicated to dispatch him. Palpatine then asks how easy it would be to kill the girl. He expresses his concern that Rey is still popular amongst supporters of the Resistance and executing her could cause unrest. Santeca explains his plan to get around this by having Rey simply be killed by fellow prison inmates. He explains that DJ could easily hack into the prison system and cause Rey's cell door to malfunction, while some of the more sadistic and violent inmates would be happy to kill Rey for them. This way, they could simply say that the death of this girl shows why the First Order is needed to put down these savages. Palpatine agrees and instructs Santeca to let Hux know that he is authorized to take out Kylo. As Santeca leaves, he picks up the phone and begins making a call. We see Hux answering it as a malicious smile creeps across his face, and he assures Santeca that he'd be happy to be of service. Meanwhile, Poe lands on the planet and discovers that they are already having issues as the First Order and the Republic are vying for aerial superiority. Poe begins making orders and commands the fighters to cover the military engineers setting up the surface-to-air ground cannons. This action involving Poe is interspersed with the attempt to assassinate Kylo and Rey. Kylo walks down a hallway as a group of troopers confront him, asking him to come with them. Meanwhile, DJ is in a control room where he opens the relevant cell doors to reach Rey's cell. Kylo senses something is wrong as we see several criminals enter Rey's cell with various improvised weapons. Kylo suddenly ignites his lightsaber and cuts down the troopers sent to assassinate him. There are so many, though, that he's eventually forced to flee. He jumps out of a window as he uses his Jedi parkour to navigate the various levels of the building without using the stairs. At the same time, Rey begins to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the men who have been sent to attack her. Kylo continues working his way through the government buildings as security guards are told on the radio that Kylo has gone rogue and is betraying the First Order. Eventually, Kylo works his way into a shipyard where he finds the Millennium Falcon. I've actually been quite bad at keeping track of who has the Millennium Falcon in my rewrites so far, including at one point just making an obvious continuity error. I have Rey go to see Luke in an X-Wing in The Last Jedi, but when she goes to confront Kylo at the end of that film, she's in the Millennium Falcon. So I just need to go back and fix that error by saying that Rey had the Millennium Falcon all along in Episode 8. With this fixed, it therefore makes sense that the Falcon would have been captured when Rey was. So Kylo gets into the Millennium Falcon and is able to take off, while Rey continues to fight with the prisoners in her confined prison cell. Then there's a brief pause in the fight as Rey hears a low rumbling sound. Kylo is pulling the Millennium Falcon up next to the prison cell. 
As I said, in order to achieve their rapid crackdown on criminality, the First Order began turning freight containers into prison cells, sort of like how people talk nowadays about the idea of living in shipping containers. The prison cells would look like freight containers and would be stacked in the same way you'd expect to see freight containers stacked. So Kylo extends some mechanical arms from the Millennium Falcon and grabs the freight container, pulling it out of the stack. Don't worry, by the way, the entire prison doesn't come tumbling down. It's not like a game of Jenga. But what this does mean is that Ray's fight with the prisoners is now occurring in a moving prison cell, while at the same time, some fighters have now shown up to stop Kylo from escaping. So Kylo is having to do some pretty tricky maneuvers through the city. This leads to Rey having a very dynamic fight as the room moves around her. Throughout the course of the fight, most of Rey's attackers end up falling through the open prison door and hurtling towards the ground miles below, until eventually Rey is fighting with the last prisoner, the same prisoner who antagonized her earlier in the canteen. He is strangling her as she gasps for breath until she suddenly goes quiet and has a force connection with Kylo letting him know exactly what to do. Kylo does a maneuver that allows Rey to escape and cause the last of her attackers to go flying out the cell door. Also, to neatly wrap things up, he crashes into and ultimately disables the last of the ships pursuing the Millennium Falcon, so Kylo is able to take off as Rey shuts the door. Poe also relaxes after having successfully repulsed the first of the First Order waves of attack. He lands and is informed that they'll need more manpower if they have any hope of repelling additional attacks. Poe recognizes this, but expresses confidence that there will be more people who show up to join the fight. We see some First Order troopers on the desert planet of Pasana. They're processing some equipment, including some jetpacks so they can fly now. One of them remarks about how the Stormtrooper armor looks new, and half-jokingly asks if they're thinking about bringing back the Empire. The other says not to even joke about that, because he's heard some rumors that apparently Palpatine's coming back. The other trooper dismisses this and says that his colleague is too gullible. He agrees that it's probably nothing, but qualifies his worry by saying, you know, I had family on Alderaan. Some more shipments of weapons come through, when suddenly rebels jump out of the truck with guns and take the First Order troopers captive. We see that they're being led by Finn. One of the rebels is a bit underwhelmed by the weapons they've captured, but Finn says that they've not come for the weapons. He points at a satellite dish and explains that it beams messages to all First Order troopers. Finn holds a cassette in his hand and explains that it contains a message of resistance. And if all the First Order troopers heard this message, they would realize that it's not in their interest to back the corrupt and authoritarian First Order. Finn begins to head up when suddenly he hears a gun cock behind him. One of the pirates, a woman who Finn had come to know quite well, has decided to betray him. Finn asks why she betrayed him, and she makes a comment about how picking sides simply wasn't profitable enough. Captain Phasma emerges and takes Finn into custody. This shows the contrast between Finn's true character of integrity and principles and the other outlaws who only have a conditional allegiance to the fight against darkness. This also makes it clear that Finn has in fact made the right choice by aligning himself to the rebellion rather than continuing to live as a pirate without any clear values or sense of direction. Meanwhile, in a dim room we hear a loud thumping. As the camera pans, we see some light streaming through a small crack in the door as Rey continues to smash her fists against it, trying to open it. Eventually, she pauses and collects herself. She breathes deeply, reaches out her hand, and focuses. The door goes flying off the cell with a loud crash. She steps out and realizes that the cell block she has been inhabiting for years now lies stranded on an island. It's not like the island Luke was on in Episode 8, but is instead much more of a tropical paradise with white sandy beaches and crystal blue oceans. She looks around, taking in the ambience, as beautiful pterodactyl-like tropical birds fly across the sky. She looks around and sees Kylo sitting down, motionless and silent, staring out at the ocean. Rey uneasily attempts to initiate a conversation, but Kylo continues to stare off at nothing. Rey sits down next to him and looks his way. She correctly infers that Kylo is a wanted man now, because presumably he is the one who saved her. Kylo despondently asserts that nobody will find them where they are. He pauses for a second and then says, We could just stay here. Ray looks at Kylo with a sense of confusion before staring out at the ocean and considering the possibility. She walks towards the ocean as she removes a layer of clothing and begins swimming in the sea, cleaning herself properly for the first time since having been captured at the end of episode 8. Finn sits forlorn on a prison transport ship. He begins punching the ship's walls in frustration, prompting another prisoner to comfort him. Finn explains that he was so close to being able to send out a message that would cause people to rise up against the First Order but now he's unlikely to get the chance. 
The prisoner responds to this by pointing out how wrong Finn is. He asks, where does Finn think all of these prisoners have come from? People across the galaxy are rebelling, and the desire for freedom is spreading faster than the First Order can suppress it. For every rebel who is captured, more rise up. That's why the First Order isn't just killing all the rebels they capture, because they know that this would cause even more rebellion to break out. The prisoner assures Finn that the rebellion is alive and well, and after all, the prisoner knows a thing or two about rebellions, being Lando Calrissian. So obviously, Episode 9 reintroduces Lando Calrissian, so I figured I might as well do that too. However, considering how ridiculously coincidental Lando showing up was in the Disney version, I am allowing myself a coincidence here too by having Finn and Lando happen to meet each other. Obviously, the implication is that Lando has become active as a rebel leader and was recently captured in a battle. It's not necessarily that ridiculous that both Lando and Finn would be captured at the same time, as the war is really ramping up. In fact, in the grand scheme of Star Wars coincidences, it's pretty typical. It's certainly not as ridiculous as Lando deciding to hang out on a desert planet indefinitely until the main characters happen to run into him. Unfortunately, we at this point cut to Law Santeca, saying that the logistics of their situation have changed, and they need to start executing prisoners. Several generals argue that using the prisoners for forced labour is more valuable, but Santeca says that killing some prisoners would send a clear message not to rebel against the First Order. He then leaves the meeting and consults with Palpatine, assuring him that the prisoners will be executed as Palpatine wishes. Palpatine says this is good, and will help him with their final plan. Santeca then asks what they plan to do about Kylo and Rey escaping. Palpatine says that he will deal with them, as he has sensed the power of their Force connection. At this point, we see a group of black-clad warriors leaving Palpatine's presence, and presumably heading off in search of Kylo. Rey walks along the beach at dusk, when she suddenly sees light shining from the Millennium Falcon. She walks into the ship and sees Kylo looking contemplatively at the interior of the ship. The two sit in silence for a while, before Rey breaks the silence by asserting, you know, we can't just sit this out. Up until this point, Rey has been tempted by Kylo's desire to just stay on the island. She has been incredibly disillusioned based on the revelation about her parents in the previous film. However, Rey ultimately is a good person, and she knows that she has to stand up for what's right. Kylo probes as to why it should be their fight to fight. Why do they have to get involved in this conflict? Rey responds by saying that it matters that they stand up for what is right, and not just in terms of them owing something to the world, but in terms of standing up for what's right being something they owe to themselves. Rey now realises that her parents may have been neglectful degenerates who sold her for drinking money, but if she allows herself to become cold to the world based on that, she's only hurting herself. Kylo responds by saying that throughout history there have been people who have fought for what's right, and all that effort has been wasted because evil is still as alive as ever. This gives us a window into Kylo's thought process. He's frustrated with what he perceives to be the flaws in civilization, and his motivation to join the First Order was the idea that with enough violence and control he could somehow fix humanity. However, he's now convinced that ultimately, solving all the world's problems is not possible, and so he's concluded that the entire idea of wanting to change the world for the better is a naive endeavour. Ray's counter is that actually the fight of good versus evil is primarily a fight that exists within people, and what matters most is not whether evil can be eradicated from the universe entirely, but whether any given individual, in any given moment, chooses good over evil. Kylo looks around at the interior of the ship. He breathes heavily as he realises that perhaps there is an important role he has to play in the upcoming fight, but at this point he's unwilling to admit this, and Rey gives up trying to force the issue. Poe continues his preparation for the big battle, when he hears news of Finn having been captured. Poe considers his options for a second before deciding to head off in a ship with BB-8. One of his generals asks him whether leaving now to save Finn is what's best for the mission, to which Poe replies, probably not, even as he continues heading off. It's clear that Poe has grown as a character, and now understands that he can't always be the maverick who is just led by his gut. He's willing to take the responsibility of thinking more tactically, and seeing the bigger picture, rather than the opportunity to blow things up in front of his face. However, at the same time, he's still a human, and in this case he just wants to be there to help his friend, who he cares about. Before Poe leaves, he gives command to C-3PO, and as Poe speeds off we have a comedic scene of C-3PO suddenly delivering some perfect military strategy to the generals. I like this joke, although I have stolen it from Hot Fuzz, so you can judge me for that if you'd like. Very good, what he said. Rey and Kylo eat some fish that they've roasted on the beach, as Rey tells Kylo that she's going to take off tomorrow, with or without him. Kylo is about to start saying something constructive, when suddenly red lightsabers erupt all around them. 
Rey and Kylo stir as they use the Force to grab their own lightsabers. As they approach the fire, the dark figures become easier to discern. Rey and Kylo steady themselves mentally before engaging the Knights of Ren in combat. It's basically like the throne room fight in The Last Jedi, but I don't know. I'd actually care about the choreography and not have clear errors occur obviously in shot, but it'd be what the throne room fight was trying to be. Two incredibly powerful Jedi working in tandem with each other as they take on a larger host of less competent warriors. Poe arrives at the First Order base on Coruscant, where the prisoners are being held. Around the planetary cityscape, various prison ships orbit as satellites to show the First Order's commitment to law and order. Much like in A New Hope and, well, lots of other Star Wars films, he's pretty much just able to bumble his way through the base. He blasts a few troopers and has to hack a few doors with the help of BB-8, but overall, him getting to the control room is pretty uncomplicated. In the control room, he finds DJ and coerces him with the threat of being shot to load up various software that Poe would need to control the prisons. Rey and Kylo continue fighting to defeat the Knights of Ren. The Knights represent the biggest challenge either of them have been confronted with so far, but by working in sync with each other, they're able to defeat them. They pause for a moment to catch their breath, before Rey turns to Kylo and asks if he has any idea what they were. Kylo considers the question before offering the best explanation he can. When the Empire first took power, it was with a vast clone army. Most of these clones died off pretty quickly, however, with clones being weak-willed, many of them became bonded by the Force to the will of the Emperor. When Palpatine's body was destroyed, he used his life force to gather his followers to Exegol, the Sith homeworld. There, Palpatine's spirit resides, attended by the broken spirits of the beings he has corrupted to serve him. These shadowy wraiths, feared for their loyalty to Palpatine's spirit, are known as the Knights of Ren. Kylo then clarifies that everybody thought of this as a horror story that wasn't at all credible. Kylo even named himself in reference to the myth in order to inspire fear. Rey then points out that it's not a myth, clearly. These servants of darkness who have attacked them are servants of Palpatine, and this must mean that Palpatine is alive, and if Palpatine is alive in any form, he must be planning on coming back to full strength. Law Senteca comes to confront Poe as his troops work to break into the secure facility where Poe is barricaded. Poe rapidly fiddles with the control panel as even more Coruscant security forces surround every exit from the control center. At this point, Santeca calls for Poe to come out and give himself up, since he is surrounded. He also tells Poe that his mission is pointless. Even if he freed the prisoners, there's no way they will be able to get away from Coruscant without being killed. Poe finishes up what he's doing on the computer, and he informs Santeca that he wasn't trying to help the prisoners get away, he was trying to bring them here. With this, Law Santeca looks into the sky as dozens of prison ships fly towards Coruscant. He starts shouting for the First Order forces to prepare themselves for battle. Poe announces himself as General Poe Dameron on the prison intercon system, and we see Finn realize that Poe has come to save him. Suddenly, the doors to the ships open as thousands of prisoners spill out into Coruscant. Santeca commands his men to fire on the prisoners, but they are overrun and forced to retreat to a defensive perimeter. Before making it off the ship, Finn is intercepted and challenged by Captain Phasma. The two have a brief fight which ends in a similar manner to Phasma's death in the original Episode 8. I liked the idea of Finn triumphantly declaring himself to be rebel scum, however this story is too big for Phasma to be anything more than a mini boss fight. Now free to move around the complex, Poe and Finn run into each other and begin to work out how to proceed. Poe says that they'll need to escort any rebel pilots they can identify to the shipyard so they can fight off any First Order attempts to stop their escape. Meanwhile, the rebels will have to head for some faster troop transports if they want to have any hope of escaping. However, Finn expresses a different priority and asks Poe about the intercom system he was using, and whether it could transmit to First Order bases. Poe says that yeah, he thinks it should be able to, and Finn takes out the tape that he wants to broadcast. Poe understands what needs doing and says that he'll go play the tape while Finn gathers up as many rebels as he can to escape off the planet. We see that the First Order troops have now properly organized themselves and are beginning to turn the tide against the prisoners, who lack enough weapons to properly defend themselves. Finn rushes around trying to identify pilots, while Poe uses the intercon system to tell rebels to head to the shipyard. He then begins setting up the system to play the message across all First Order ships and bases. As the rebel troops begin to leave, the First Order uses surface cannons to fire on the transports. Poe realizes that the fighters aren't going to be able to take out the surface cannons without opening themselves up to being fired on and certainly killed. Poe informs Finn what he's going to do, and Finn pleads with Poe not to do it. However, Poe clicks to broadcast the message Finn gave him, and then heads off to a ship. The message begins uploading as Poe rushes to a ship. 
Just as Poe's ship emerges from the shipyard and heads to the First Order defensive line, the message starts playing. The message is Poe's voice. It's a recording of him telling Finn what he told him at the start of the film, about how he needs to take a stand for what's right. We hear this message playing as Poe heads towards the surface cannon, being fired upon as he does it. Finn reacts in horror as Poe heads towards certain doom. And then Rose Tico flies in and crashes into him, pushing him out the way. No, I'm just kidding. See, Finn's sacrifice at the end of The Last Jedi is actually quite a powerful moment, but the way that he is prevented from making that sacrifice is pretty stupid and has the effect of making the characters feel like they've got plot armor. I don't think it's good to kill main characters just for the sake of it, but I do think that a heroic sacrifice here and there can make for a more emotionally resonant film. So Poe does actually die. He blows up the surface cannons, saving the fleeing rebels, just as his ship is destroyed by the enemy fire he's taking. The ship crashes in a cascade of fire. In the silence as Finn processes what has happened, we hear the last of Poe's speech, stressing the importance of taking a stand for what's right and inspiring others to do so too. Rey is suddenly overcome as she senses Poe's death with the Force. She tells Kylo in that moment that they have to go confront the Emperor now, before it's too late. Kylo pauses and makes a resigned face before saying, no, he can't go. Rey realizes that Kylo isn't ready to come with her, so she goes to head off, leaving Kylo with his head in his hands. She heads towards the Millennium Falcon, but at the last moment she stops. She looks back at Kylo, then at the Falcon. She looks at the footprints from the night before when they were confronted by the Knights of Ren and tracks them to the ship they arrived in. She decides to pilot that ship, leaving the Millennium Falcon behind. Meanwhile, Finn is trying to cope with the loss of Poe when suddenly he hears a whimpering from somewhere. He looks around before pulling open a trunk and finding General Hux. Finn grabs Hux and begins to physically attack him, but Hux cows in fear and Finn finds himself unable to enact any sort of retributive violence against somebody so pitiful. Eventually, a rebel soldier actually asks Hux why he's stowed away on their ship. Hux struggles to collect himself before stuttering out the words, but Palpatine, Emperor Palpatine. This causes quite a stir amongst the rebels listening nearby. Finn asks what he means by saying that. Hux explains that the First Order has been taken over by fanatics who are committed to bringing Palpatine back to full power. Hux, of course, has no interest in this, considering his consistent disdain for the Force throughout the series. I also like the idea of Hux becoming an increasingly impotent and pathetic character. It's honestly very cringy to me that anybody thought that Hux could possibly have been a viable final antagonist for the entire saga, especially after Episode 8. But for me, Hux as a pathetic loser is honestly kind of interesting, because we've never really had a villain like that in Star Wars, and also him slowly going from a credible threat to an impotent disposable nothing is a pretty substantial character arc that's present in the Disney version, probably the only character arc that remains consistent throughout all three films. In the first one, he's an intimidating commander who carries himself with dignity. In the second one, he's getting thrown around by these powerful force users. And in the last one, he's given up on any aspirations of power himself and is just acting out of spite before being unceremoniously shot. It's actually kind of impressive. Everything else about the sequel trilogy is so jumbled and inconsistent, and the general perception is that Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams were playing tug-of-war over every aspect of the trilogy, but on Hux they managed to accidentally produce a character with a well-defined and well-realized character trajectory, so I can't in good conscience bring myself to cut the one thing from the sequel trilogy that wasn't an inconsistent mess. Hux can retain his role in this story as an increasingly embarrassing loser here. But of course, Hux's main purpose here is to introduce the Rebels to the fact that yes, Palpatine is back and he has control over the First Order, who are apparently helping him return as Emperor. This revelation is then backed up by seeing Lord Santeca and other First Order commanders convening around Palpatine's spirit. Palpatine expresses that he is feeling weak and drained of power. DJ limps forward and asks if there's anything he can do to help. Palpatine's spirit echoes throughout the chamber, declaring that DJ has always been such a loyal servant. DJ agrees with this as he gets closer to the cloud that shrouds Palpatine's spirit. At this point, DJ becomes suddenly gripped by pain as the life is slowly drawn out of him, and he withers away until crumpling into nothing. Palpatine then says that Kylo and Rey have gone their separate ways and will be more vulnerable. We see more Knights of Ren depart from his presence. A while later, Rey lands on Pisana to resupply her ship. She walks around the market to buy some food when some dark figures begin pursuing her through the market. Rey speeds up her pace as the figures chase her, until suddenly she leaps out of an alleyway and kills two of them. She goes to pick up one of the lightsabers dropped by the Knights of Ren, suddenly having an intense reaction sensing the dark side in the weapon. She recoils in fear at first, 
but she is eventually able to face up to her fear as she grabs the weapon, concentrating and allowing the power of the dark side coming from the weapon to flow through her without dominating her will. Finn arrives at a rebel ship where he is able to meet up with Rose. They hug tightly as Rose consoles Finn about Poe's death. A group of rebel troops stand around a holographic projection of the second Death Star. One of the troopers explains that they tracked down the old Death Star schematics like Finn suggested. We then see the hologram explode in a perfect imitation of its explosion at the end of Return of the Jedi. One of the rebel officials says that they've analyzed the schematics and concluded that the throne room portion of the Death Star would have blown off in a direction where it would have likely been pulled into the orbit of a large planet called Kef Beer. Lando says that if this rumor is true, that Palpatine is planning on returning, there might be some evidence there. On Kefbir, Finn, Lando, Rose, and Hux walk along a busy street. Suddenly, Finn stops and looks at an old antique store. Rose looks at him with confusion and asks why he's stopping, to which Finn quietly says, a feeling. They leave Lando to supervise Hux, while Finn slowly approaches the antique store and begins looking at the antiques. He looks through them with increasing frustration as he can't see anything that appears to have anything to do with the Death Star. He sighs in resignation and just as he is about to conclude that his feelings can't have meant anything, he hears the shopkeeper leaving a back room and saying that he found a similar dagger on a beach just a few miles away. A woman thanks him and Finn instantly recognizes her voice as Ray's. Finn is barely able to control himself as he is reunited with Ray for the first time in years. He runs forward and hugs her but the jubilation is limited, as Finn is unable to keep herself from asking about Poe, even though she already senses that something is wrong. Finn tells her about Poe's fate as the two mourn him together. Meanwhile, Kylo is sat moping on the island. He's trying to catch a fish, but finds himself unable to do so and quickly gets frustrated. In his angry state, he is even less able to concentrate or to lure any of the fish. He angrily walks along the beach until he sees that Rey did not in fact take the Millennium Falcon. He walks into the ship and starts rummaging through the supplies, finding some shelf-stable food that is kept on the ship for emergencies. Unfortunately, the food is maybe not quite as shelf-stable as he'd have hoped, as he immediately retches from the taste. He continues digging through the various compartments and storage areas of the Millennium Falcon. Suddenly, at the bottom of one very old, dusty box, he finds some tapes marked only as memories. Kylo takes them out and begins playing them. He sees himself as a child, with his father, hand doting over him while Leia records the interaction. The exact interaction isn't hugely important, but Ben remembers in that moment who he was, and that becoming that person again is a choice he has the power to make. He looks up purposefully at the controls of the ship. Ray and Finn walk down to the beach with Rose, Lando, and Hux along with them. Finn explains that they're trying to find some information about how Palpatine could be planning to return so they can stop it. Ray says that her plan was simply to work out where Palpatine is so she could stop him directly. They reach a great lake where the water has a slight tinge of darkness to it. They conclude that the wreckage is probably out there in the water. Finn begins to talk about the logistics of reaching the wreckage, but Rey is already walking into the water as she dives underneath it. Finn looks back at Hux, Lando, and Rose and declares that he guesses they'll be holding their breath. All five of them swim to the wreckage, which is fortunately quite close to the shore and not that far underwater. Once inside it, they find themselves in an air pocket where they are able to breathe. They look around at this ancient relic of a battle from before almost any of them were even born. They continue walking, taking in the spooky ambience of the whole area. Ray slowly approaches the opening to the shaft that Palpatine was thrown down, clearly being drawn to it. In a scene that mirrors her introduction in The Force Awakens, she repels down it until she discovers Palpatine's bones. She puts her hands on them, and hears the sound of Palpatine calling her to him. She reacts with terror and pain as she feels the darkness of Palpatine's spirit calling out to her. Suddenly, she is able to break Palpatine's domination of her mind as she reaches out and ignites a lightsaber. It's Luke's lightsaber from Return of the Jedi, which she looks at with recognition before pocketing it. She heads back up to the main throne room and tells them that she knows where Palpatine is, the Sith homeworld of Exegol. Finn says that they still don't know how he's planning on coming back, but Rey assures him that she can worry about Palpatine. Finn and Rose need to worry about stopping the First Order army, as that clearly has some role in Palpatine's plans. While this conversation is going on, we see Hux drawn to a side room of the throne room that is filled with a variety of ancient Sith treasure. He helps himself to a lot of it, but is particularly drawn to a gem mounted in the wall. He pulls firmly on it and eventually tears it from the wall, feeling triumphant, until suddenly some water starts to leak in from the now compromised wall at an increasing rate. 
Hux runs away as the whole room starts to flood. Finn, Rose, Lando and Rey all run away too as Hux sprints off. While running, Finn asks him what that thing is that Hux is holding. Hux derisively responds that that thing he's holding is worth more than a small planet. He continues climbing, having gotten a head start on the other three. As he passes through a doorway, he suddenly pulls some rubble down, blocking the path of the rest. He smiles and waves goodbye, declaring that he's sorry he's going to miss his trial for war crimes, but he's got a small fortune to spend. The others begin to panic as the room still fills with water, and as it fills we see that the Death Star is sinking further into the lake. Hux goes to run away when he is suddenly cut down by a Knight of Ren. More Knights of Ren emerge. Rey tries to fight them off, but the rest of the gang isn't able to offer much assistance, and Rey is struggling to defend them against an attack. At the same time, the room is beginning to implode from the growing pressure, as the Death Star sinks further into the depths of the water. Rey breathes heavily and recognises what she needs to do. In a brief moment where none of the Knights of Ren are trying to kill her, she reaches out and grabs the walls of the building with the Force. The rest are confused about what she's doing, and even the Knights of Ren pause their attack for a moment out of confusion. Suddenly, the walls are pulled away, and the entire chamber floods with water, killing the Knights of Ren. Finn, Lando and Rose slowly uncover their eyes, having all expected to be crushed from the water. Instead, they see Rey, stood in the middle of a makeshift vessel from the walls, which Rey is holding in place around them with the Force to protect them from the lake. This considerably lighter ball of air slowly rises to the surface. On the beach again, they ready themselves for the culmination of all their efforts. None of them really expect that they have much hope, but they're committed to doing their part. Lando says that he's going to head off to rally some of his old rebel allies. Before he leaves, Finn asks him how they did it during the time of the Empire, and Lando smiles before saying that they had each other. Finn expresses his sadness that Lando can't see Han and Luke for one last time, but Lando assures him that he'll see them again someday. After setting up and preparing for the length of the film so far, the rebel troops finally get a full sense of the power of the First Order. Giant starships emerge out of hyperspace, and the rebel ships engage with them despite their inferior firepower. At the same time, the ship sends out hundreds of troop transports to the surface of the planet to capture the rebel surface cannons. The battle for the galaxy begins as thousands of soldiers die within the opening few minutes. Rey arrives on Exegol. Her fighter touches down on the dark and dusty netherworld as she slowly approaches the large, foreboding temple where Palpatine's spirit resides. As she makes her way through it, she becomes increasingly aware of the power of Palpatine's command over the dark side. Meanwhile, Finn arrives at the battle with Rose and many other rebel fighters as they start to fight their way through the frenzy of lasers and explosions. After a bit of intense space battle, Finn hears word that the forces on the ground are struggling and need reinforcements. He instructs some of the fighters to head down to the planet where they can offer support to the ground troops, which suits him since he isn't much of a pilot anyway. Rey enters a large room where a human figure is beginning to take shape. From the ethereal pool of Palpatine's spirit, Palpatine now has something approaching a physical form. He is getting stronger. He acknowledges Rey, but is indignant at the idea that a woman with no significant lineage would be challenging him as if she's worthy of his recognition. He fires a lightning blast at her, but Rey is able to block it with her lightsaber. Palpatine is able to recognise and appreciate the fact that Rey clearly has some ability to withstand him. Palpatine steps forward out of the whirling black pool where his spirit has been consigned. He advances on Rey as his spirit continues to coalesce into a human form. He fires lightning at the ground in front of her, causing an explosion of lightning that knocks Rey back several yards. He walks over to her as he comments on how weak the Jedi are now, that even their final hope can barely withstand him. He begins to torture Rey with lightning. Rey tries to resist by igniting her lightsaber to block the lightning, but Palpatine is able to use the force to effortlessly pull her lightsaber from her grip and throw it away. All of this is interspersed with shots of the final battle raging. I'm not sure how many times it would cut between the two confrontations, because obviously that would have to be dictated by the actual pacing of the film. Certainly the pacing of the film would be different than the pacing of this rewrite here, so I'm not going to interrupt my own narrative flow to be like, oh by the way, the battle is still going on too frequently. However, there would definitely be cutting back and forth just to remind you that the battle is going on. One idea I do like for the battle is that the First Order has various space monsters on their side, just to make the battle seem even more epic. So you'd have soldiers facing off against giant powerful creatures, almost like a Godzilla or a King Kong film. But anyway, Ben Solo shows up to help Rey, but is confronted by some Knights of Ren. 
There are only a few left now, but there's still a challenge to defeat. Ben is able to kill all but two of them quite quickly, but in the fight, his lightsaber gets destroyed. Meanwhile, Rey uses her green lightsaber she pocketed to block Palpatine's force lightning. This actually seems to work, and Palpatine has less command over the lightsaber that was wielded by Luke Skywalker in the moment when Palpatine's physical body was destroyed. Rey advances on Palpatine, but in that moment, she also force connects with Ben, who is defenseless as two Knights of Ren move towards him. Rey finds herself with the choice between helping Ben survive or killing Palpatine herself right now. She pulls her weapon back behind her, as if to bring it down in a strike on Palpatine, but instead she brings forth her hand to reveal it is empty. Ben uses the green lightsaber to defend himself and kill the final two Knights of Ren. Palpatine comments on how Rey continues to disappoint him with her weakness. He is now able to torture her further with his lightning powers. Rey writhes in agony as Palpatine indulges in destroying her. He pulls her towards him with the force, and then turns around to move her towards the dark, writhing pool where Palpatine's spirit has been residing for the last 30 years. A dark force reaches out of the pool as Rey becomes weaker and weaker. Palpatine is sucking her life force. However, in this moment, he hears a lightsaber ignite behind him. Ben Solo approaches him with his green lightsaber. He tries using lightning to stop Ben, but Ben blocks the strike. Rey, on the floor and weakened, is able to reach out while Palpatine is distracted and pull her lightsaber towards her. She ignites it and stands up to confront Palpatine too. While all this is going on, the Republic suddenly find that the battle turns in their favour, as Lando shows up with a new wave of rebel fighters, many of them former First Order troopers who heard Finn's message of rebellion. With these reinforcements, the First Order begin to lose ground and the fighting intensifies. Rey and Ben move towards Palpatine with their lightsabers raised, however, in this moment, a bright white flare of lightning emerges from Palpatine's fingers, and when the lightning dissipates, he is holding a lightsaber, red but glowing brilliantly with the power of the Force imbued in it. Palpatine is able to hold off Rey and Ben by sparring with them. He is still an old and quite weak man, so his movements are very minimal, but effective. With the slightest effort, he is able to dodge, strike at, and unbalance Rey and Ben. They try to defeat him, but try as they might, they can't outmatch Palpatine. In fact, he seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Finn commands the troops for battle from the ground barking orders to ensure they continue making progress. He looks around at the destruction from the battle. As he sees the thousands of people already dead, he finds himself considering the thousands who are still going to die before the battle is over. He suddenly has a moment of clarity. He realizes what's going on. Palpatine is using the wasted life force from this needless death in order to sustain his own life. As he puts it to Rose, it's the battle, the death. Palpatine is using the battle to make himself stronger. In this moment, we see Palpatine best Rey and throw her across the room before killing Ben with his lightsaber and throwing him as well. Ben slumps over in a pile as he exhales and the light leaves his eyes. Palpatine heads towards Rey, and for the third time, he begins to torture her with lightning. However, this time, it is clear that his command of the Force is even more powerful than it was at the start of their confrontation. His body now exists well beyond only the spiritual sense. He now has a fully human form of flesh. Palpatine has definitively returned. Rose asks Finn what they should do. Finn struggles with that question. Obviously, they have to end the battle, but without any more loss of life. He racks his brain before declaring, quietly, almost to himself, we use the Force. He gets on a walkie-talkie and sends out a message. He identifies himself as Finn, the First Order soldier who rebelled against the First Order. He recognises that a lot of people might have been inspired by his story to come over to the side of the Republic but there is something else that he says they now need to do. They need to join him in taking a stand against death and destruction itself, and in favour of peace. He says that when the transmission ends, he wants everybody hearing his message to put down their guns, or take their hands off the controls of their fighters, and just sit and meditate. Stop everything they're doing, and just feel the life running through them, the energy, feel the force. He ends the transmission and starts to meditate. He breathes deeply and keeps his arms crossed. We begin to see the other soldiers doing the same. Many of the soldiers react to Finn's message with complete amusement and keep on fighting, but as they look at their comrades meditating, slowly more of them feel compelled to join in. Even as the First Order continues firing on them and killing them, they don't resist with violence. They refuse to participate in the battle. Palpatine appears to still be getting stronger. 
but the pool from which he has been gaining spiritual power begins to gradually change. It was previously dark with a red tint, but now it changes to being lighter and with an increasingly blue tint. Ray somehow finds the strength to get up and resist the lightning, even as it tortures her. As the meditation continues, we see more and more Republic soldiers put down their weapons and silently meditate. Finn breathes in a controlled and calm manner, even as bullets rage all around him. But over on the First Order side of the battle, some soldiers are beginning to feel uncomfortable about firing on people who are themselves completely unarmed and passive. We see some of the First Order soldiers putting down their weapons and refusing to fight. The pool now turns fully light and blue as Rey reaches out to the pool and starts to draw strength from it herself, while a horrified Palpatine looks at his hands as he feels his strength diminish. Rey gets to her feet and continues reaching out to the spiritual energy. We see Jedi emerge as Force ghosts from the pool, some of whom we know, but many of whom we don't. The spread of meditative peace begins to take over the entire battlefield until it even reaches the command center of the First Order ships. Santeca angrily shouts at the troops to continue fighting, but the troops refuse, questioning what purpose there even is to fighting. Santeca declares that if they don't fight, he will shoot them. One of the troopers looks around with amusement and just replies, Really? All of us? At this, Santeca realizes there is nothing he can do to exert his will over the situation. He stands there, completely impotent, as the battle stops. Luke's Force Ghost emerges from the Jedi Collective that now stands alongside Rey. He assures her that she has the power to do what needs to be done, with the Force by her side. Rey throws away her lightsaber and pulls Palpatine's spirit from his body. His dark spirit is ripped apart by the power of the Force. His body disintegrates as it is no longer animated by his spirit, which until now has lived on without his body, but now even his spirit is destroyed. Finn pauses and declares that he thinks it worked. Palpatine has been defeated. A First Order troop transport comes down, and Finn holds Rose's hand. All the troops hold each other's hands, as they believe that the Final Order is sending down more troops to kill them. However, they are willing to face death if that is the cost of their opposition to violence. The doors open as First Order troops spill out, and their generals command them to start helping the wounded. First Order and Republic troops embrace as they search for those who can be revived. Finn smiles. He looks at Rose as Rose kisses him. They've won the war. Amidst the sea of various spirits, Ben Solo steps forward. Luke turns to him and tells him that he did say he'd see him around, but not yet. Ben's spirit drifts over to his body, and he awakens. Ray begins to get teary as she asks whether Luke could resurrect himself. Luke tells her that he's had his time. He lived a full and complete life. Now it's Ben and Ray's turn. Still, Luke says, why let all this life force go to waste? The blue energy spills out from the pool across Exegol, and begins to rejuvenate the entire planet with greenery and flowers and flowing waters. The planet that had been rendered dead and barren from the dark side now teems with abundant life. If you're wondering why they couldn't use the life force to heal people in the battle, it's because the battle would have been too far away, and the life force just couldn't travel that far. Also, in general, exercising excessive control over the Force is more dark side than light side, so I think it would make sense that the more Jedi thing to do would be to allow the Force to create life as it naturally flows out, rather than being controlled and manipulated specifically to bring certain individuals back to life. Ben is the exception because he is literally on Exegol right next to the pool, so it makes sense that the Force could bring him to life. Anyway, this final shot of Exegol now, an Edenic paradise, transitions us to the end of the film. Rey is operating a school on Exegol as she gives a speech to some students about meditation. Close your eyes, feel what it is to be alive, recognize you can't control it, let your spirit be caught up in the flow of the force, feel the intensity of your emotions, serenity, happiness, love, frustration, sadness, hate. Feel these emotions, but don't let them consume you or define you. While Rey is giving this speech, we see evidence of how the world is changing. People are happy, the world is being rebuilt, Santeca is in prison, Ben Solo is also conducting his own lessons similar to Rey. Rey talks about the cyclical nature of death and birth, as we see Finn and Rose with a newborn child as they stand over the grave of General Poe Dameron. And there is one last message we close on. Rey mentions that this force that binds all things is available to everyone. At this point the camera zooms out, and we see that the group Rey is teaching is not some small select group of elite Jedi warriors, it's a collection of thousands of people from all walks of life. And this is the big change that this film leaves us with. 
The Force is no longer a strange, foreign thing to most people, that is principally a weapon to be used by the Jedi and the Sith. Instead, the Force is available to everybody. It's a religion, a source of guidance. Yes, some people are still stronger with the Force, and not everybody can use the Force to fire lightning, or lift an X-Wing, or perform insane feats of acrobatics, or block blaster bolts. However, they can use the Force to cope with emotional distress, or to guide them in how to live their life. They can use it to help them have better relationships, and to form deeper connections. They can use it to appreciate the beauty of life. And the final message of the film should hopefully be, that's actually the most important thing. If Anakin Skywalker is the most powerful Force user ever, who could use the Force to fly a spaceship really well, and do epic dual wielding, and even destroy the body of a Sith Lord like Emperor Palpatine, but then he can't cope emotionally with the mortality of those he loves, then of what use was the Force to him? He had all that power, but was fundamentally unable to accept the reality of the world as it is. Conversely, some random person can use the Force to guide them and help them accept bereavement, and yes, they'll never do any of the cool Jedi stuff that Anakin did, but in a very meaningful sense, they have a more powerful command of the Force than Anakin, because their command will actually help them in their day-to-day -day life, and help them to avoid losing the battle that Anakin lost, letting his emotions override his sense of right and wrong. If the Skywalker saga is going to end, it needs to end by defeating the ultimate source of conflict. You might think that I brought Palpatine back because he's the ultimate source of conflict, but he isn't. The ultimate source of conflict was the entire idea that the Force was something that an elite group of warriors have so that they can solve all of the world's problems by being really powerful. The end of this story is about realizing that actually, even the small amount of Force sensitivity that the everyday person has is enough to make a big difference if it's part of a collective effort to build a better society. Basically, this conclusion is one of populism beating out elitism. And when you look at the politics of the conflict of Star Wars up until this point, I think it's fair to say that this conclusion is therefore one that will lead to a much more lasting and sustainable balance of the Force. And that struggle to bring uh, democracy back to the galaxy. So there it is, the end of the sequel trilogy, the end of the Skywalker saga. I hope you all enjoyed it. Many, many months worth of work went into rewriting this whole trilogy, so please leave a like and things like that, uh, share, etc. Subscribe, of course. More importantly, check out my other stuff and subscribe so you can see what else I do in the future. Thank you for those who have stuck with this since I first uploaded the episode 7 rewrite. I really appreciate you. Goodbye.